is time for us to have a fresh look at the Revelation, the last book of the Bible. I have taught this book three times already. It was 12 years ago the last time that I went through the Revelation verse by verse. Oh, I've taught almost all the Revelation in different forms and fashions, different lessons and different parts and different sections. There's a series called 69 Prophecies to be Fulfilled Before the Second Coming of the Lord and other things like that that you can find that are in my, on my website and on my YouTube channel and my Vimeo channel and all that. And you can go and you can see those videos. This go around is, is interesting because Technology has advanced so much in the last 12 years, and on top of that, the mindset of the world, be it the Eastern mindset or the Western mindset of the world, has changed so much that things 12 years ago that we could not even put a finger on how things were going to be fulfilled now today, we can take a fresh look at this book because we now know how foundations are being laid to fulfill the promises of God. Now, we call it a prophecy, but you know I call it promises of God. All prophecies are promises of God. So when we come to this book of the Revelation, we all know this book in our minds, we think, hey, it's an amazing book. It's a, it's a mystifying book. It's baffling. It's astonishing. It's surprising. It's bewildering. But you have to understand that every, everything and every word in this book of the Revelation is true. Every word will be fulfilled. Catch this. Listen to this. Every word will be fulfilled in the same order, in the same way, and in the same time as it's presented in the book of the Revelation. Well, so wonderful of a book. It's the promises of God. Now, this is the story uh, in the book of Revelation. This is the story of the Lord's future, of His second coming, of His reign as King of kings and Lord of lords, and as His fulfillment of all the other promises that He has already declared starting back in the book of Genesis and running all the way through to the book of Jude, the revelation picks up on these promises and tells us how they're going to be fulfilled. Now, throughout the entire book of the revelation, it's prophecies, the promises that will occur in the, catch this also, this is important, in the normal course of, of the progression of time, in the progression of industry, of how things work, how things are designed to work, and in the process of politics. So it's, it is telling us everything is going to happen in the normal course of just progress of how people are developing and how they're developing things around them. The progress in industry of how things are being developed and the progress of politics. When certain things have been put in place in, with humanity, certain prophecies will be fulfilled. Each prophecy will build on the one that came before it. Each prophecy will require time to develop and come to pass. Here are some well-known prophecies uh, to use as some examples of how the Lord fulfills prophecies. For instance, when Hezekiah was sick on his bed and Isaiah had told him, you're going to die, and the Lord turned to Isaiah around and said, go back into Hezekiah because he's prayed. I've heard his prayer. And go back and tell him the future. And tell him that he's going to get to live 15 more years and tell him the future. And so Isaiah turns right back around, goes into the bedchamber of Hezekiah. And while Hezekiah is sick on the bed, still sick, but about to be healed, Isaiah says to him in one of the prophecies, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Now that's part of a storyline that Hezekiah is going to hear that he's going to tell to the people of the Jewish people of Israel. It took, once that prophecy, for unto us a child is born, was given to Isaiah, it took 670 years to come to pass. 
It took 17 generations of Hezekiah's descendants to fulfill that prophecy 670 years before. And so Hezekiah is going to have a son by the name of Manasseh who's going to have a son, who's going to have a son, who's going to have a son. And you go all the way down to the 17th generation, 670 years later, and that son's name is Joseph who is not actually the blood father of Jesus, the child that is born, but he is the adopted legal father of Jesus. Another one. When Isaiah announced that Cyrus would be the appointed and anointed person that would let the Jewish people return to the promised land from exile, it was interesting because no one in the promised land was in exile yet. But it took 150 years after Isaiah gave the prophecy that over in Persia, a baby boy was born, 150 years after the prophecy, who they named him Cyrus. Isaiah had prophesied his name exactly what it was, and it was to be Cyrus, and appointed him and anointed him to be the one to let the Jewish people go. So 150 years later, Cyrus is born in Persia, And then we have to wait until Cyrus is 61 years old when he captures the Babylonian Empire and turns it into the Persian Empire. And he lets the people who have been in exile from the Babylonian and Assyrian Empires to return to the Promised Land. 211 years after Isaiah said Cyrus is going to be the one, 211 years later, Cyrus lets the people go back. Uh, Go, for instance, to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. If you remember, he wouldn't tell any of his his, uh, counselors what the dream was, but he wanted someone to tell him the dream and interpret the dream, and so uh, Daniel was brought in. It was at least 30 years until his fulfillment of his first point of of his dream in the prophecy fulfilled. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was the Babylonian king, the king of the empire, and 30 years later, Cyrus the Great takes over the Babylonian empire for the Persian empire. It takes 30 years to fulfill the head of gold turning to the two arms of, of silver, the Medo-Persian empire. In another 206 years, uh, before Alexander the Great defeats the Persian empire, and made it the Greek empire of the world, and fulfilled that prophecy of that part of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And then 299 years later after that, the Roman Empire defeated the Greek Empire and it became the kingdom of the world to fulfill that part of Nebuchadnezzar's prophecy. It took then the Roman Empire 425 years to decide, hey, for protection, we need to divide into two different divisions to fulfill that part of the prophecy. There was a western leg and a eastern leg formed. And then just 81 years after that western leg was formed, it was taken over by the German people and divided into five countries or five little toes. The, the eastern leg lasted another 1,085 years after that happened. And it was divided by the Muslims who conquered it into five countries or five toes. All of this was done in the normal course of human life. That was my first point in this introduction to make to you. It was done in the normal course of human life with human decisions, with human politics, and human progress. Each portion of Nebuchadnezzar's dream took time to fulfill. We are still waiting for the very last point of Nebuchadnezzar's dream to be fulfilled, and that is when those ten toes join together to fulfill that part of the prophecy. And by the way, that is going to happen in the sixth seal in the Revelation. Of course, almost everybody around who's had been in church whatever and heard anything about the Revelation knows that there are six seals, Then the, I mean there are seven seals, and then there are seven trumpets, and there's seven bowls of wrath. And this happens during the sixth seal of the revelation. In the normal course of human development, 
engineering and progress. And that's the purpose of this first introductory lesson to, to, to get you on board so that you know there's really not a lot of mystical, magical things that are going to happen uh, miraculously to cause the events in the Revelation to happen. They're going to happen in the normal course of history. And you might say, hey, does that mean that man is in control of the future? And you might say, yeah, it's correct. Well, you also have to remember that the all-knowing Lord knows all the details of man's future decisions and development. And the Lord prophesied those decisions to us in order to prove, prove that He is God. He did the, all the prophecies of old that have already been fulfilled, like the Isaiah one, the Nebuchadnezzar ones, down to the, the ten toes, to prove that He is God. He tells us the future so we will know His plans for the timing of the arrival of His second coming to earth to be the ruler of rulers and the people ruler of the people of this earth for 1,000 years. That will come in chapter 19 of the Revelation. He then tells us the rest of the story that will pl take place in all of eternity after he comes to be the king of the world for 1,000 years. Oh, the Revelation, the Revelation. It means the uncovering. That's what the word revelation means. It means the uncovering. Sadly, it seems that everyone misses the point that Jesus is simply uncovering the details of his return. Think of it as you're sitting in an auditorium waiting for a Broadway play to start. And the music starts and the curtains open and you now see the scenery of what's going to happen in this Broadway play. Okay, this is a Broadway plan of God for the future and he's going to unveil it to us. Or better yet, think of it like this. Think maybe down at City Hall. Your, the, the town has commissioned a, a painting to commemorate something or a statue to commemorate someone. And you go to the dedication. And once you are there, that statue or that painting is under a black drape. And it's totally covered so you cannot see it. And no one has seen it but the artist and the people who delivered it there. And it sits under that black drape. And you will have no idea what it looks like until someone pulls the drape away to reveal what is hidden underneath the drape. That is what the word revelation means in Greek. The Greek word is apocalypse, which means the uncovering. Now here's the problem. Our normal new definition of the word apocalypse means destruction, but that is not what it means. In fact, in many of your older Bibles, the last book, which we call the Revelation of Jesus Christ, is called the Apocalypse of Jesus Christ. But when the definition of the word apocalypse Re, uh, changed to be a time of terrible destruction. So everybody thinks that when the apocalypse happens, it, that the whole world is going to be destroyed, blown away by fire. It's the end of the world. There is no end of the world, folks. There is no end of the world. The heaven, the place of heaven and God's home, we're going to find out at the book of, at the end of this book, is going to come down. The Jerusalem is going to come down and sit on this earth where it will be for all eternity. Here on this earth, earth. The revelation tells us the story of the reunion of God's chosen people with their Lord, the Jews with their Lord. In their stubbornness, they rejected the Lord when he came to become the full and the final sacrifice for sin. Their eyes were blinded then and they're still blinded today. Hmm. But this promise shows how the Lord will use the normal progress of time and history in the future to come uh, of the world before he arrives 
and then his chosen people will finally accept him as their Messiah and reign with him as he rules the world with absolute authority for 1,000 years. It's the revelation. It begins with the story of Jesus and ends with his coming when that occurs. And that's going to occur soon, folks. Accept it for what it is. Add nothing to it. Take nothing away from this book. Let me start over just to make sure you catch that. Accept this book for what it is. Add nothing to this book. Don't take anything away from this book and say, oh, that's impossible. That's, that can't happen. It is his promise that it will happen just as he said it will inside of this book. Chapter 1, verse 1a says, The revelation of Jesus Christ. It seems that the whole world wants to know about this book. For some strange reason, new Christians dive into it before they know anything about all that has transpired to make its message understandable and meaning, meaningful. Movies. Movies have been made about it. About the end times. The Armageddon. The, the final battle. This and that and all these things. Books also have been written about it. Rarely dealing with the actual material inside the pages of this book. They all have one thing in common. The terrible end of the world. But the revelation really does not have anything to do with the end of the world. Rather, it has everything to do with the world's new beginning in the eternal future. How do we know that for a fact? We know it because the book of Revelation, the last book of God's written word, it is given to us for a purpose, and the purpose is to pull together all the prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled in the final summary of things yet, and it's the final summary of things yet to occur. And it sprinkles in just a few new facts into the mix just to fill in the gaps. You say, what do you mean by that? I, I say, th th what I mean by this is there are still multiple parts of what is in the revelation that the seeds of those ideas and those theological thoughts and those promises are given in the Old Testament and in the Gospels and even in the writings of Peter and Paul and Jude and Luke. I mean, in the Acts. There, there are things there that are still yet to be fulfilled. Oh, the revelation. You know, it holds the position as the last book of God's Word for this purpose. You see, the Bible starts, and it started in eternity past, before the world was created, and it ends in eternity future. The story begins with God's crowning creation, man and woman. Man and woman are the only part of God's creation who have the ability to communicate with God and the ability to choose to love or to reject Him. Your puppy dog doesn't have that ability. The mosquito you killed last night doesn't have that ability. A snake doesn't have that ability. No creature has the ability to love or reject the Lord. And throughout the story that starts in Genesis, God has made promises and predictions concerning His crowning creation, man and woman. And by the end of the Bible, long before the words are going to be fulfilled, long before time concludes, He summed up the story of the future in this last book of the 66 books that tells the tale of the magnificent work of God. The Revelation. You know, we cannot study it without looking at all that came before it. The Bible has a purpose in its organization. So let me give you that purpose in a real quick synopsis. 
It begins with Genesis. And think about Genesis as being the foundation book of which everything else is built on. Genesis covers 2,700 years from creation to Jacob's family settling into Egypt. And if you remember, Jacob's name was changed to Israel and his descendants took that new name as their name for their nation, the nation of Israel. Therefore, Genesis is about the heritage of God's people, which leads to the family of Israel, which leads to Jesus. The next layer above Genesis is that of the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Esther, Nehemiah, and I'm going to include Job in that because Job has history in it that occurred between Israel being in Egypt and Moses going to get Israel out of Egypt. That's where the book of Job fits in the storyline. These books tell us about the formation of the history of the nation of Israel and the other people in the world who were descendants of Abraham from the Exodus from the Exodus coming out of Egypt to Israel's return to the promised land after the exile. Now the next layer up includes the the writings and the songs and the poems and the sayings of these people, the nation of Israel, that were produced during the time of that second layer. Uh, these are the things that were produced and written down during that second layer time. And then, of course, the fourth layer includes the books of the prophecies. Even though these prophecies are separate books, the human writers of each of those separate prophecy books at the end of the Old Testament lived sometime during the second layer of the people that's right above the book of Genesis. Uh, When the history of everything is is going on during the Old Testament. So, what is going on is God provides us and shows us through all the things that happens that He is God and we can trust Him to keep His promises through Genesis, through the prophet books of the Old Testament. We call it the Old Testament. But the greatest promise of all found in those Old Testament books is the coming of the Savior. And by turning to the New Testament, we come to see that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would not be stories of at all if it wasn't for the entire Old Testament. It had not happened. Did you catch that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would not have happened if it wasn't for the Old Testament. Those four books build on the Old Testament, the next, the next level up. And that fifth layer tells the heritage of the coming Savior and the establishment of the church. Then comes the sixth layer. We know that is the book of Acts, which tells the story of the formation of the development of that church that Jesus started. The seventh layer is, presents the writings of the church, beginning with Romans, and goes all the way through the book of Jude. And in that layer, we learn how the church is to operate as in, in a different realm than what Judaism is still operating uh, that rejected the Lord. And then, of course, the eighth layer, the point of that triangle, the New Testament prophecy book it, that is called The Revelation Appears, and it rests on the writings of the church, which rests on the, on the, on the establishment of the church, which rests on the history of, and heritage of the church, which rest on the coming of the Savior, Jesus Christ, and that information, which rest on the prophecy of the Old Testament prophecy books, which rest on the writings of the nation of Israel, which rest on the formation of the nation of Israel, which rest on the foundation before the formation of Israel. You cannot understand the end of this book without understanding the beginning and all the minute 
pieces revealed in between. And we will, in this study, we will go back and grab many of those pieces from the Old Testament just to show you where the seeds of the thoughts and the promises in the Revelation were planted back all the way to the book of Genesis. Here's one just, just for you. Listen. The serpent who is going to be tread upon from Genesis chapter 3, upon the head he's going to be trampled on, is not going to happen until the judgments that are found there in the Revelation in the last chapters of the Revelation. When Satan is judged, that old Leviathan uh, dragon demon the Leviathan of the Old Testament, the great serpent, the snake, the demon, the devil. We call him Satan when he will be tread upon in, in the future, in the revelation, in that timing, when that timing tells us it's going to happen. A whole cast of characters is involved in the revelation. And it will help us tremendously if we get to know a little about that whole cast of characters before we start the study. In fact, that's where we're going to be next week. We're going to start learning about the characters. We're going to learn about the family that is in the book of Revelation before we study it so that we will know when we come to sit and dine and feed at the word of the revelation, we will know who everyone is when they're sitting at the table in that story. Now, as far as the outline of the revelation, I want to give that to you. The revelation actually uh, is given to us in three time parts, three part, a three-part outline that are timed. Uh, the Lord actually provided us this outline in chapter 1 of the Revelation, verse 19, which is, you know, 19 verses past where we are right now. And in that, in that verse, it says, there, he said to John, uh, he said, Therefore write the things which you have seen, that's part 1, and the things which are, that's part 2, and the things which will take place after these things. That's part three. Now, verse 19 is deep into that first chapter. Not much comes after that. And it comes after the Lord has shown himself to John. And he says, John, write down everything I look like as you're seeing me in that first chapter. And John writes it down. What He writes down all those details. That's the things, part one, that John has seen to start off the revelation. So thus the details about the vision of the Lord are the things which you have seen, you being John, have seen. First chapter one. Then for part two, the Lord tells John, write down the things which are. Now the Lord has not revealed when he says to John to write down the things which are. He has not told John yet the things which are. He will next in chapters 2 and chapter 3. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, the Lord will dictate a letter to each of the seven churches of Asia Minor. John knows these churches very well. As the last living apostle of the church, he had the power still over the operation of the church, and he installed each of the pastors in those churches as to be their shepherd, to be their, their under-shepherd of that church for the Lord. They were all disciples of John. Much is revealed in these seven letters that tells us about the rewards that we, you and I, are going to receive when we pass from this life into glory with the Lord. And each letter has a promise and a warning. Got that? Each of those seven churches are given a promise and a warning. Each of those churches will one day close their doors and cease to exist in that location. The church doesn't cease to exist. The people scatter okay, and go to other churches. But the churches in those seven locations cease to exist uh, as, as they were at the time of the writing of the Revelation. But when the Lord had John write each of those letters, they were the things that which are. The things which are. They were the churches in place. So from chapter 1 through chapter 3, the Lord has John write down what he the Lord looks like those things which you have seen, chapter 1, and the letters to the seven churches are the things which are in chapter 2 and 3. That's the second part. 
Now, finally, the third part of the revelation, the Lord has John write down all the things that will happen in the future. Got that? He'll write it in the future after the churches. Remember in verse 19, the Lord says to write down the things which will happen after these things. Well, you say, well, after what things? Verse 19 says, after these things. Well, we know about the things that are. That's the churches. We know of the things he's seen. That's the Lord. What are after these things? What does it mean? It can only mean one thing. It means after the promises and the warnings of, that are given to the seven churches have been completed and fulfilled, those churches have closed their doors, then and only then can the events of chapter 4 begin that will take us all the way through chapter 22. How do we know this? How can I say, Jim, you say, Jim, how can you tell me this to be true? Well, I know it because the Lord told us this is the timing of all that is to take place after the seven churches cease to exist. It's in chapter 4, verse number 1. It, we don't have to wait down into the chapter to get it. It's in verse number 1 where John was told this. After these things I looked... And behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Catch this, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. After what things? After, after after the promises and the warnings to the seven churches have been fulfilled. Hmm. We must remember this is a prophecy book and prophecies are promises from the Lord which He will fulfill before the culmination of time as we know it here on earth. It just so happens that we know exactly when each church closed its doors and we know how it came to be that they closed their doors. Church history has recorded the history of these seven churches in detail for us. Once the last church closes its doors, the prophecies in chapter 4 can begin. Have they begun yet? Or is all of the chapter 4 and everything still in the future? The answer is yes, they have already begun. And the prophecies of chapter 4 began to unfold after the final closing of the last of the seven churches to close its doors in 1922 when it ceased to exist. Now think about that. That church had existed since before 96 AD and it lasted until September, October of 1922. That is an astounding. That's an over that church uh, ministered in that city of the seven churches for over 1,800 years. Amazing. So, with the start of chapter four, the outline of the events that will occur in order in order, not out of order, are as follows. Chapter 4 and 5, the Lord, the Lord has John write down and describe the throne room of God in heaven. Chapter 6 through chapter 8, verse 1, John is to describe what is happening during the seven seals with all the details surrounding those seven seals. Chapter 8, verse 2 through 15, chapter 15, verse 4, the Lord has John write down all the events that take place and surround the fulfilling of the seven trumpets in order. They're not out of order, they are in order. And then in chapters 12 through 16, the Lord has John write down all the details and events that surround the seven bowls of wrath that are going to be poured. And with the pouring of that last bowl, chapter 17 through 9 through 18, 17 through 18, 
we have the judgments from heaven with all the surrounding details and judgments. Chapter 19, we have the joy, the royalty, and the procession uh, in and from heaven with all the surrounding details about that. Chapter 20, we have the parade of the satanic and his defeat with all of those details. And finally, in chapters 21 through 22, we have the heaven coming to earth with all of its details. You say, well, Jim, there's a whole lot more involved in that. Yes, there's a whole lot more in the revelation of that. But all that whole lot more sits inside of each of these sections of this outline that's laid out for us. And so we conclude this introductory lesson here as we do that. Here is my appeal to you about the revelation. Here's my appeal. Don't ever be afraid of it. Do not be afraid of it. Do not overthink it. Don't speculate. Accept it for what it says. Do not stretch it out. Do not shrink it. Do not speculate about it. Accept it in the order it is given. Do not add to it. There's a warning about that, by the way. Do not take away from it. There's a warning about that in the Revelation also. Accept it as the timeline for the future. Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not worry about its details. Do not speed ahead in the details. Accept your place in the details where you are right now. Do not think that you can change it. You can't change it. It's written in stone in the last book of the Bible. Do not think that you can ignore it because things are going to happen as time progresses. Accept it as the Lord promises for or let me put it this way again, accept it as the Lord's promises for all that is to come from now to eternity. And with that, with our next lesson together, we're going to have a family banquet where we're going to learn all the characters. We're going to pull them all together and we're going to learn about who they are so that we will know who they are whenever we get to them in the storyline. So the characters will be our next lesson. The characters that are in the book of the Revelation in the order of their appearances.